The Art of Winemaking, Chapter 19. Good wine is made in the vineyard, and great wine is made by blending. Belle Marie hosted a blending party the last weekend of each year for wine club members, dividing us into groups, giving each samples of a single varietal wine pulled from barrels, and challenged us to create the best possible blend. This is wine education at its best, tasting the different concoctions with everyone in holiday spirits. That's where I learned the artistry of blending. Good thing it was a short drive home on a local road. An artist's mixing of colors and skilled brush strokes bring a canvas to life. Winemakers do the same. Blending for blending's sake is not good practice, especially if you end up with witch's brew. We tasted some of those at the blending parties. If you combine two or three wines and the result is better, that's a good thing and the cardinal rule of blending. You must end up with something better, otherwise don't blend. San Diego County's summer sunshine and heat waves tend to produce grapes higher in sugar and lower in acid. You can always do an acid addition to the must. That's wine speak for grape juice if the acid's too low. So low acid isn't the end of the world, not counting the time Paul did an adjustment by pouring a pound of tartaric acid into the juice without measuring, because he saw a winemaker on YouTube do that, and ruined a batch. Then there was a time Sheila added white powder to a batch of wine that looked like tartaric acid, but was citric acid, a cleaner. Whoops. Oh, what a blessing San Diego's bright sunshine and moderate heat would be to Bordeaux when back in the day it was the occasional record hot summer that resulted in outstanding vintages. New World wine regions have all the sun wine growers of France used to dream about. Stellenbosch in South Africa, Adelaide in Southern California, and San Diego in Southern California. The New World's bold wines are forged by an abundance of sun, which is also San Diego's blessing. Try a glass and taste for yourself. Of course, global warming may end up boosting some European wine regions. Imagine Southern England becoming the new Bordeaux. The wine grower's task, like an airline pilot, is to bring the grapes in for a smooth landing. For most of San Diego's growing season, the vineyard is on autopilot, given the region's consistent climate. But just as you can unexpectedly hit turbulence and drop 1,000 feet flying a jumbo jet, Mother Nature can throw you a curveball. It might be a heat wave a week before harvest, or worse, 100 degree temperatures in mid-June that shrivel, burn, and ruin green grapes unsheltered by leaves the prudent vineyard maestro removed to increase airflow to reduce mildew pressure. Ouch. Another year, a rare summer rain late in the season may cause grapes to grow mold or rot, or worse, an unseen enemy that, when bunches are at their ripest beauty, the grapes liquefy at your touch, destroyed by Botrytis. Have I frightened you from planting your own vineyard? Don't worry. Fasten your seatbelts. Flying your vineyard is as safe as driving your car. The heat wave is light chop. It's to be expected, and damage can be avoided by turning on the water. Or, if your grapes are underripe, you welcome heat as a tailwind to speed things up. Managing the vineyard is an art. Winemaking is art. My Barbera's acid is high, and I'm going to blend it with other varietals with lower TA, Carrie Ann said in wine speak, TA standing for tri titratable acidity. Acid impacts taste. Wine with low acid tastes flat, and wine with too much acid tastes, for lack of a better term, acidic or too tart. For the reds, the winemakers here shoot for TA of about 0.6 grams per liter, plus or minus depending on their objectives and preferences. When Paul realized his Tempranillo was low acid, he took a cue from Carrie Ann and blended it with his higher acid grapes, such as Grenache and vice versa. Although he couldn't smell, he could sense a wine's acidity on his tongue and tartness in his cheeks. And in August, as he walked down the rows popping grapes into his mouth, he noticed the Tempranillo didn't have the tartness of the Alianico or Grenache. Winemakers can easily make an acid adjustment to increase TA in the juice. But if the grapes are harvested early with the acid too high, 
There is no easy way for garagiste to lower the acid except by blending in lower acid wine. Then Carrie Anne started talking about deacidif deacidification with calcium carbonite and potassium calcium carbonite and double salt deacidification and Paul's head started spinning. It seemed they were all dropping acid and suffered from alternative reality delusions. When Paul discussed it with Sheila, she insisted they make pure wine without additives other than yeast. Fortunately, they never had a problem with high acid grapes that couldn't be solved by blending. Next time you visit a winery and want to demonstrate your knowledge, ask the server, or better yet, the winemaker, about the TA, bricks, and pH of the wines you like and any you don't, and make notes. Bricks is a measure of sugar with sweeter, higher Brix grapes producing wines with higher alcohol. A reading of 24 Brix, a general target for the winemakers here, results in a wine about 13% alcohol plus or minus. So if you're enjoying a big red wine, the Brix might have been 25 or 26 at harvest. Ask the winemakers, they'll tell you. Do you remember something about pH from high school chemistry? You can't taste pH in wines, but it's important because pH affects stability and shelf life. High pH wines won't last long. The death zone for wine is a pH of 4.0. Winemakers want to be below that, preferably between 3.2 and 3.5, and even 3.7 is manageable. Bricks, TA, and pH are related, which is why winemakers always talk about the numbers as harvest approaches, when, hi, how are you? is quickly followed by, what's your bricks? As sugars rise in grapes on the vines, acidity falls, but pH rises, and the wine grower must decide the optimal Goldilocks time to harvest, balancing the variables. For example, suppose the winemaker is shooting for a bold wine. She lets the bricks rise to 26, high, the acid falls to 0.38, low, and the pH rises to 3.7, relatively high and approaching the death zone. She'll make an acid adjustment to the must by adding tartaric acid, raising the TA to the 0.6 range, and lowering the pH to a more manageable 3.5, which is important because wines with high pH require more sulfite additions to keep from spoiling, which can affect taste, and even then, the shelf life may be short. Carrie Ann was well suited for this task because she was into the numbers. Paul's harvest date depended on Sheila, who was likely to say, I don't want to pick the grapes in two days. I want to pick on Saturday, the picking time determined by when she preferred to host a party or moved up to save the grapes from attacking birds, bees, and critters, not analytics. Joe the Wino's grapes were like Old Faithful. They were ready Labor Day weekend every year, his harvest timing as good as his stock market trades. If a heat wave strikes before the harvest, the landing could be rough. I've seen winemakers add water, yes, water, to their sweet nectar after harvest to lower bricks to a reasonable level. If the sugar is too high, not all of it will be converted to alcohol and you'll be stuck with a notice, noticeable residual sugar in the wine. That's fine for some styles of wine and Finger Lakes jug wines, but not the fine wine to which our winemakers aspired, unless their aim is to make a late harvest wine and residual sugar, or a port wine where sweetness is desired. I know I'm not supposed to call it port. You can only call it that if it's a fortified sweet wine from Portugal. So get over it because I'm calling it what it is. For dessert wines, wine growers shoot for the highest possible bricks. I've seen them reach 41 bricks after cold soaking, raisin laden juice from extremely ripe fruit. The Merlot port made by Merlot Mac washes down the chocolate pretty good. Of course, his recipe for fine port was to have his grapes crushed by the breast of nuple maidens rather than good port made with their feet. Paul had five different vineyards with five different varietals and a rainbow coalition of grapes with varying levels of acidity, pH, and flavors to work with. Since Sheila was a purist, Paul stopped making acid adjustments and blended wines from their estate grapes to achieve the right balance in flavor, tartness, and pH. Pre-harvest, Paul controlled the pace of ripening by managing the canopy 
and irrigation until his freedom to irrigate was restricted. Post-harvest, he shaped his wines with various techniques, each a brushstroke to his canvas. He lengthened cold soaking before fermentation, extracting more fruit flavors and color without harsh tannins. He decided how long to ferment before pressing and pressed with a hand-powered ratchet press with the right amount of force to extract the right amount of tannin. He stirred up the muddy lees settled at the tank's bottom with his favorite golf club to improve the mouthfeel. The French call it batonnage. He used minimal sulfites. He didn't filter or fine the wine. He carefully selected wood for his barrels, settling on hybrid barrels made from French and American oak, and how much to toast the staves. He decided how long to age the wine and whether or not to reuse a barrel, and then to create a wine that caused his muses to smile, a wine that forever changed the lives of those who sipped. He tweaked, nudged, perfected it by blending. Each year, the winemakers, the winemakers held back wine for topping barrels drained by angels, using it to tweak their creations. I use our best wine for topping, said Belmarie's Mick. Why would he add anything of lower quality to his wines? Occasionally, he made a kitchen soup wine, using all his leftovers to fill a couple of barrels. When Sheila and Paul tried this one year, combining leftover carboys, that's wine speak for a five-gallon glass container, from various years of Zinfandel, Grenache, Tempranillo, Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot, Carignan, and Anigo, into a 60-gallon barrel, Bluey, Paul called it Bluey's Blend, and value priced it at fourteen ninety nine per bottle since it was a mud. Twelve months later, the day came to bottle Bluey's blend, along with a vintage Tempranillo. It would take all day, like driving from San Diego to San Francisco. The passion fruit vine Sheila planted behind the house was climbing up the winery's back door, a vine she admired each day from the kitchen, win kitchen window, but was damaging the screen. Would you like me to move it from the vine from the door, Paul asked, intending to train it so it climbed the wall instead. She stormed over to the vine and ripped it from the door. There, isn't that what you wanted? I just wanted to move it from the screen to the wall. You're killing me, she said. Could you find someplace else to live? There were days talking to Sheila was riskier than walking through a field mined by Viet Cong. Paul decided to keep quiet and with Bluey by his side, started the task. Bottling is the cross I bear and there's nothing to do but confront it head on. This 2011 Tempranillo is the first Tempranillo we've made that's the whole package. Fruit and nose and mouthfeel and tannins, beginning, middle and end, a winemaker's trinity. Amen. Not a word from Sheila for 30 minutes, as the enomatic bottle machine hummed and bottles clanked against the power, the hand-powered corker. Paul pulled the level down to compress the cork, then rammed it into the bottle. Swish! Don't let the glass hit the steel or that ping will set her off. Pull! Swish! You have to be crazy to make good wine, he said to break the ice. You're fucking crazy, Sheila rebutted. That's why our wine is so good, he replied. And her chuckle cut through the tension, and Bluey's ears picked up, and he smiled. And Paul knew he had emerged unscathed from today's minefield. She held bottle for a while, then went inside, went outside to talk with the vines, while Bluey stayed under the table, waiting for wine to spill. As he continued bottling, Paul had a vision. The expression of growing, crushing, pressing, blending, tweaking this wine is the work of an artist. Making wine is painting without the paint, sculpting without the clay, poetry without the prose. Winemaking is art. Then the image of Penelope Cruz painting a canvas with broad, large, fluent strokes, and the movie Vicky Cristina Barcelona came into his head as he bottled his Tempranillo masterpiece. Tempranillo, the famous grape from Spain, and he dreamed of sharing a glass of his wine with the Spanish actress, and the thought of creating wine for her lightened the burden of bottling. And Paul laid down his cross, picked up his lance, and became a modern-day knight-errant on a Quixotic mission for his Dulcinea, painting a masterpiece of artistic wine for his muse. As he rinsed the hoses and mopped the floor after bottling, Sheila dismembered the barrel and put the staves into a trash can, to Paul's chagrin, as he planned to use the barrel to make a table, 
or as a pot for plants to line vineyard walkways. It wasn't worth getting upset about. There would be more b other barrels. She went inside to shower, while Paul cut stems of Provence lavender from the lavender fields forever, binding them together with twine into a bouquet worthy of an antique shop, remembering the lavender at Mary Frances in Normandy, crushing purple petals from a plant larger than a Van Gogh painting between his fingers and relishing the lingering aroma. He sighed, unable to smell his lavender. He would present the bouquet to Carrie Ann, since she was hosting a winemaker's dinner that evening. As he thought about what he could make from used barrels, a light, perhaps it was candlelight, flickered in, in his brain of this self-declared crazy fool. From the trash, he salvaged the longest stave with a hole in the middle and turned it into a candle holder. When Sheila and Paul entered, entered Carrie Ann's lair carrying two bottles of wine, the price of admission to their winemaker's event, Paul presented the hostess with the catnip for a cougar lavender and received a smile and hug. Then he handed her the candle holder with the candle, which she took to the main dining room table and lit before serving dinner. All the winemakers from the area, who lived close enough to drive home safely, were there, and then some, cooking or tasting and commenting on all the wines, from the very day made by guest French winemaker Pierre Celan, visiting from his California property in Sonoma, to a fine burgundy brought by Joe to the Penelope Cruz-inspired Tempranillo. Jenny Lee, visiting from Texas, brought a Texas Tempranillo. As Mick stirred the pasta sauce, Carrie Ann plucked a sprig of lavender from her bouquet and tossed it into the pan, throwing Paul a wink. That will taste good in le pasta, said Pierre. We have a word in French to describe all of you. You are gourmands because your life revolves around friends, food, and wine. Everyone talked about their upcoming harvest plants, their pHs, and their acids, where they were buying their barrels, who had the best deal on bottles, who had the highest quality corks, corks versus screw caps, a winemaker's recital. Carrie Ann's surfer dude friend, whom she called her pusher, as he always sold her some great wine at an amazing price, showed up with a ridiculously expensive Indonesia coffee that comes from the ass of a cat which got Paul to thinking what he might sell that came from the rear of an owl or coyote. The evening ended on a sour note as Janet, who enjoyed a little too much of everyone's wine, slammed a car door on Joe's finger. It hung by a string, and Mick, the dental surgeon, bounded, packed it in ice, and off to the hospital they went. Janet was so ordinary at times. Who knew if it was an accident? As Paul lay with Bluey in bed, he wondered what Carrie Ann thought about her gift, if he wanted to be the light of her life or plug her with his candle. Pardon the last expression, but this is the woman who asked Paul, when he needed an airlock to keep freshly pressed wine fermenting in a carboy from erupting all over the floor. Do you want the bubbly ones or the condom ones? He politely replied he'd prefer the bubbly ones and didn't say what he was thinking. Carrie Ann saw the gift for what it was, a clever candle holder. That suited her house. And the next day, Paul salvaged the other staves from the trash, purchased a hole making bit from a, and a drill from Home Depot, and, for the first time in his life, used a power tool to do woodwork, making candle holders from wine barrel staves he sent to his muses, who adored them, thinking he was one of the kindest men they knew. He would have sold more lavender bouquets and candle holders had he focused on those products instead of wine and tilting at windmills. Perhaps, if Paul had shown as much attention to Sheila as the muses or his dog, he would have thawed her frozen heart. As for Bluey's blend, Paul shared a bottle of their kitchen soup wine at the gourmand's dinner and was surprised everyone said it was good and suggested he age it a year. Twelve months later, when he carried a case to a wine tasting, about half the visitors said his non-pedigree mutt was their favorite, liking it more than the Pen Penelope Cruz-inspired Tempranillo. So he raised the price to $35 per barrel or per bottle, upgraded the name to Bluey's Cuvée, and sold the 22 remaining cases in a month.